Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So hi, hi everyone, we are going to start the next session and in this session we will be talking more about the competitive equilibrium that we were trying to derive in the last session and the reference books and the topics remain same. So we will be re referring the book uh, mostly of the Williamson and then to some extent the Sanjay Chuk. This particular book that I mentioned last, Backhouse, this book will be uh, referred only for understanding why microeconomic foundations are important. So to give you a brief background that what we did in last two sessions, so we were talking about how we can arrive at equilibrium, how we can uh, define the representative consumer, representative firm and with the interaction of representative consumer, representative firm, how we can think about finding the competitive equilibrium. So that was the uh, analysis that we were doing and to some extent we had also discussed certain comparative statics that how and in what situations when you have a increase in wages or increase in dividend or increase in taxes then how this is going to react to the consumer's choice of consumption and leisure. So basically we are trying to understand the one period framework, there is no future period, there is only, uh, only one period which is the current period and how individual agents are taking decisions about how many hours they have to supply and how many hours the firm has to uh, employ a certain amount of labor. So that kind of examination we are doing it. And in the last session we had also derived the basic part of the model that under the closed economic setup when we are assuming that y is equal to c plus g where y is also the production function, the output, this is coming from the form side and consumption is coming from the y is equal to c plus g play a very important role. We try to drive this part, so here we have c is equal to wn plus pi minus t and then with the previous uh, exercise that we did, uh, we were able to drive c is equal to y minus g which is consumption is equal to income minus the taxation or the government expenditure and g is equal to t so both are substitutable so here y is equal to c plus g so close economy model we were able to derive with the basic derivations or assumptions of consumption and about the consumer and the firm so these two are important aspects now we will be further trying to see from the graphical uh, perspective that how this can be represented so here what we are trying to see is that if you can see here you have the x axis and y axis on x axis we are measuring the labor input on y axis we have the output so what we are trying to infer from here is that if you have a uh, if the consumer is going to work for h amount of hours which means that he doesn't take any rest no leisure at all then then in that case the maximum output that at aggregate level can be produced by y star but given the the slope of this production function which is normally the marginal product of labor it is at a so at point a you can think about that this is the amount that if if at point a if you can see then this is the output that will be produced with this much amount of labor so here h minus l play important role just the mirror image of this is represented here and this is uh, also about talking about the possibilities. So here we are talking about the production possibilities. What is the production possibility is speaking about? It is speaking about that how we can transform one particular uh, good in using technology into another good. So here we have only two types of good, either you consume or you work uh, or you uh, take leisure. So here since it is downward sloping, so slope of this is MPN and here what we are trying to say is that just the mirror image, so here we are just trying to see that if H amount of, of, uh, of uh, labor is uh, or here it is the leisure, so if it is being used, uh, so H minus L, so if 
if you have no leisure at all, so full of h will produce y output and it will be the slope represented by this and it is downward sloping, so here you have minus. Now coming to third part, third part is interesting because here in third part we are, we are talking about the leisure part and here it is the, the amount of uh, number of hours that the labor supplies. So the PPF that you are mentioning here you can see here, this PPF is nothing but it is the production positivity frontier, here you have Y minus G and G is here the amount of goods that the consumer is sacrificing as in tax. So overall with the combination of these two, we are able to arrive at some kind of, we are trying to at least mention about what will be the production possibilities of this particular setup if we are going to utilize full of labor and uh, and with that labor how much output you can produce. So with this, with these three simple graphs, we are at least able to see that during so this particular part is the is the output gone already. So the production possibilities of the economy is hovering around this. So this is the zone at in which the economy will operate and it will try to convert consumption into leisure. So this is what we try to get from this. And with the help of these three charts, we will be able to derive the competitive equilibrium that we are talking about. So what will be the, so here in this chart, we are just replicating the same. Here we are saying that D to B is the point where the representative consumer is getting the income, the dividend and the tax that this representative consumer pays. So this part, particular part we are not considering. The J is the point where we are finding that slope of this uh, production positive frontier. The production positive frontier it is very common technique used in, in most of the production analysis. What it says that what is the possibility that a particular uh, form can transform one good into another and the slope is marginal rate of transformation. So here if we are talking about the slope of this then it is represented by MRT. If you are talking about the indifference curve which is the representative consumer, so then it is represented by marginal rate of substitution. Now one thing you have to note is that this is the line that talks about ABD, so this is the budget constraint and with this if you try to super, superimpose the production and consumption, so what we are seeing that the only thing that decides about the interaction between consumer and firm is the wage rate. So if I am saying that the marginal rate of transformation of labor to consumption is equal to marginal product of labor and labor will be only working when he gets the wage. So here the marginal product of labor is equal to wage. So this, uh, this criteria, it is just the exchange of hand. So here it goes by satisfying this criteria. So MRS LC is equal to MRT LC is equal to MPN and MPN is equal to wage rate. So if you have MPN greater than W, you will have a more labor demand. If you have MPN less than W, then you have a less demand. So here it works in this direction. So finally we are able to arrive at the point J where this particular labor H minus L if you think then H minus L this will be the amount of, of labor supplied and the consumer will be consuming C star which is corresponding to J point. So in this particular chart J point is the competitive equilibrium point and the BD if you move along this line, so this line is basically nothing. So we have to think about that this representative consumer will be hovering around this. Now it will have further comparative statics, but comparative statics will be only examining when we are sure that in a perfectly competitive market, so in one period model, one of the objectives is that we are trying to understand that if we are assuming a free market economy where firms and the consumers are free to interact and decide about the wage rate, then is it socially efficient also? If it is socially efficient, then can we examine with some methodology, some method that we normally uh, use in our economic analysis? So after this competitive equilibrium that we are trying to see where everything is at one place, so if you are trying to see that, then we will have to apply certain tools of welfare economics. And certain tool of welfare economics normally comes with the Pareto optimality conditions, the first uh, uh, theorem, first second theorems of the welfare. Uh, uh, so here we are talking about that 
when I am saying that the competitive equilibrium that I have achieved in which the firm is also the price taker and consumer both. So, both are price taker which means that it is a highly competitive market. If that is the case then can I say that the competitive equilibrium that I have achieved it is socially optimal or it is having the it is also satisfying the economic efficiency criteria. So, here we are trying to see the connection between competitive equilibrium and the economic efficiency. We are trying to see that how social optimal outcomes that we have just we are going to drive can be achieved under perfect competition the competitive equilibrium that we achieved. And, and whether can we say that the social optimum is better than competitive equilibrium. So, under the lump sum tax scenario when the government is going to get some amount of output from the consumer then in that scenario is it feasible to say that this representative consumer will always be happy whether this, this is the ideal situation. So, we are trying to say. Now, in the case of when we talk about efficiency then automatically it comes that how you are going to define about the, the, the condition how are you sure that a perfectly competitive equilibrium is a socially outcome or social it also having a certain characteristics of economic efficiency. For that we have a concept of Pareto optimality. So, we assume that a competitive equilibrium is Pareto optimal if there is no way to make someone better off and then there is no way to make someone better off without making someone else worse off. So, we are thinking in that direction. To determine economic efficiency in the model and to construct the Pareto optimality we are talking about we introduce a social planner term what is the term that it talks about. Here we have the representative consumer and the firm. Now, firm is going to decide about how much labor it will employ. So, that part is left because firm has to decide about the market price taker. Up to what extent we make the representative consumer happy because this representative consumer has to think about how many hours of, of labor he would supply and what is the, the amount of leisure that he will enjoy. So, he, so, in order to make sure that this particular combination remains we introduce a new agent and this agent is benevolent and this agent which is called the social planner and social planner is the main task of the social planner is that it makes sure that the representative agent is having sufficient space given and it, it tries to maximize the utility subject to whatever number of hours he or she wants to supply. So, and this social planner does not follow any market norm, it is just the superimposition. So, apart from the firms and the consumers interacting, this uh, social planner is the superimposition condition on this. So, uh, so, 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 social planner may control consumers and firms up to any extent. A part of the totally produced good is allocated to a social planner. So, whatever tax that you pay, the, the social planner is ob obliged by and this social planner will further take it forward and it will make sure make sure that you are not being exploited. And so, in, in that environment we if you try to see then uh, this is what the Pareto optimality condition looks like that if you have the given the hour setup the marginal rate of substitution for leisure and consumption is equal to marginal rate of transformation of leisure to consumption then at what rate you can convert leisure into consumption which means that more number of hours you are working and with that you have the condition of the labor market the marginal product of labor. So, if you are having these three conditions satisfied then we say that it is a Pareto optimal condition. So, if you think about the, the social inefficiency that we talk about or the parameters of economic inefficiency in particular let us focus on the economic inefficiency then here you have a two theorems relevant if you are examining in the context of competitive equilibrium that what happens if you have open economy, if you have the free market system, if you think that whatever market has decided whether it is socially optimal outcome if you think about then we have two theorems to focus on first is the first welfare theorem under certain conditions a competitive equilibrium is Pareto optimal. Second welfare theorem is that under certain conditions a Pareto optimal is the competitive equilibrium. So, these two are interlinked. So, first we have very normal case that competitive equilibrium is Pareto optimal if the competitive equilibrium satisfy the criteria of this then we can say. Second is about under certain condition a Pareto optimum is the competitive equilibrium. So, there you have the role of 
that whatever the paratoptomality conditions you have assumed, then you have to examine that whether it also satisfies the criteria of compared equilibrium. So, these two are uh, in a, uh, different but interrelated concepts. Now, in case of paratoptimality, you can see that this is the output that this particular, uh, so here we have minus g, so amount of output that, that goes to. Here we have the h minus l scenario, so this is the amount of work that this particular guy is doing. In the same way that we have the competitive equilibrium, what we see is that the, the labor will supply h minus l amount of, of labor uh, to, uh, to produce or to enjoy the consumption of c amount and you, you and we know that the, the downward sloping line we have the slope of minus w. So, the competitive equilibrium more or less here satisfies the, uh, the this competitive equilibrium that we are assuming. It is satisfying the paratoptimum criteria because it is almost equivalent to the same that we have assumed here. So, it is also having the same characteristics. So, in this case we are examining the pattern of whether the competitive equilibrium that we have assumed it is parato optimal. So, parato optimal condition is this, but apart from this you have certain considerations that when we have this straightforward case that okay, competitive equilibrium became parato optimal. So, this criteria seems very easy, but there are certain conditions in which we are not able to satisfy the criteria in which all situations the competitive equilibrium is not parato optimal. The first is about the externalities. So, in the economy you have the externalities, we, one is called negative externality, second is called positive externality. So, negative externality, what is the meaning of negative externality? Negative externality example could be that uh, if you have a, if you are, if your house is located nearby. Um, a power plant or something and a power plant is releasing uh, some kind of inter industrial waste nearby your locality then whatever you are going to get the side effect that becomes the negative externality. Positive externality could be that if you are having uh, 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 the populace located nearby IIT campus may be, may be a example of a positive externality that because of IIT you have the employment of lot of people, those who are nearby they can come and work easily. But if you think about the, the condition that if we have the power plant which is polluting the nearby area, I am talking about, I am talking about thermal power plant for instance, if it is polluting nearby area then nearby residents must be compensated for the negative that they are or the side effect that they are facing. So, in such situations it is very difficult to create a market. So, and for example, I gave you the example that those people who are coming to IIT getting a work or, or having employment, they are not paying anything to IIT because they are just uh, by living nearby, they have the opportunity access to the campus, they, they get income and then they get employment. So, they are, from their part it is welfare, but from IIT part they do not give anything. So, in the in such situations how can you create a market so market market failure becomes an issue and in that situation the competitive equilibrium may not having may not have the similar characteristics of the parato optimality second thing about the distorting taxes what happens when we have distortion of tax so if we are going for distortion of tax then it implies that we have so far assumed about the lump sum tax where certain part of income of the consumer is taken. But what happens if the, if the government is going to decide about the taxing on the, the wage income itself, so not on the your, your dividend or anything, you are just focusing on the consumer's income, so wage. So, if certain proportion of wage is going to be, then this particular representative consumer is going to face the tax incidence of a w into 1 minus t. So, if this is the, the tax rate that the government is going to deduct, which is in percentage term proportionate tax that we mentioned, then this is this is also going to create adverse scenario for the representative consumer if pi is not going to increase or if it is not going to, to uh, 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 increase substantially. Then in that situation, w into 1 minus t, the amount of shock that this particular representative consumer is going to see, this has to be compensated by decreasing the leisure. So, maybe this particular guy will have to work more number of hours 
and may not be having the, and in that situation the competitive equilibrium even if you have achieved with this tax rate it may not be optimal it may not satisfy. So, further it requires different kind of quantitative treatment, but that is not part of the course uh, you can further explore this that in which all situations a competitive equilibrium is not para to optimal. Then, then here you have the task of the monopoly power. When I say that when monopoly power, so in certain economies uh, of, uh, uh, few firms or one or two firms or suppose if you have a only one firm dominating in the market and rest of the firms are not able to compete, then that also does not create the Pareto optimality condition even if you have the any market dominance strategies adopted by the firm it is not which also means that neither the firm is the price taker and even in, in some cases if you have the from labor side also if, if you have a not easy wage takers from the market then in that case the consumer uh, competitive equilibrium if you see whatever will be the competitive equilibrium after these shocks or disturbance it will not be para to optimal. So, these three conditions are important to note because in one period model it looked very easy and smooth going that we had assumed consumer, we had assumed form, then we arrived at close equilibrium, uh, close economic equilibrium with the help of the production possibility frontier we tried to arrive at the competitive equilibrium because we superimposed the condition of consumer on that and then we see that how this, this representative consumer is going to, to decide about consumption and leisure. But when, when we started checking that whether the market clearing mechanism that has worked so far whether it is socially optimal or not, then we found that yes the, the conditions are more or less similar. So, both satisfy the only, only consideration is that if we have the competitive equilibrium um, achieving the parameter of multi condition or satisfying the parameter of multi condition, then in which all conditions these uh, these uh, conditions are not satisfied. So, we mentioned that it is externality, uh, some kind of tax strategy that is uh, quite uh, not replicable, then you have the monopoly power. Now, we will be working on to, uh, we will be now starting a similar topic which is called the, the uh, it is part of the uh, comparative statics what is the part of the competitive statics that if we have uh, if we are saying that we have achieved the competitive equilibrium then what happens if, uh, when we are going to change certain policy variables so in this uh, in this we have set up so uh, if you think about the macroeconomic model so what we are trying to see is that we have set up a model under that you have the wage and the uh, leisure and uh, consumption all are determined within the system right but there are two exogenous factors which are playing very important role one is about the government that government is coming out of the system and this government takes away some amount of in, in income from the consumer and it also acts sometime as a social planner to maintain the welfare of the uh, or to see that whether uh, the firms and the consumers are interacting in an appropriate manner or not. So, if you are going to see that then we have the, the macro picture ready that in a business cycle setup suppose if you are going to increase the government expenditure what happens to consumption, what happens to leisure, will there be any role of income and substitution effect. If you are going to examine that then that becomes a, an important topic uh, to be discussed and it can be directly linked to microeconomic theory if you have done any macroeconomic course in the past then this will help you understand that why in certain situations we do not go for immediate government expenditure even if we are facing difficult times but government does not go for increasing infinite amount of expenditure because this creates trouble and this will have impact. So, you can link with your uh, basic understanding about the macroeconomic theories here with the help of the micro foundations. So, here we are seeing the first case here is that that how we have the uh, we are seeing the effect of increase in government expenditure and as I mentioned that we have the macroeconomic model in that we, we are trying to see the business cycle phenomena. We are trying to see that which all variables if I am increasing 
then which all variables are increasing, whether wage is increasing, whether consumption is increasing, whether leisure is increasing, if all are increasing then it will be called as pro-cyclical. If two are increasing and one is decreasing, then the decreasing variable will be called as counter-cyclical. So, here we will have some kind of understanding about the macroeconomic picture also. So, here what we are seeing is that uh, we had, uh, we have the the original line going like this. So, suppose when we are saying about the government expenditure which means that when G is going to increase then tax is going to also increase. So, because government collects the tax from the individuals. So, if government is expending, expending more money which means that it is also going to increase the tax. So, here it is a direct effect. So, when we are seeing increase then we have to think about. So, suppose if this is the case, the original case which is having the, the A point as, as, the, uh, as the equilibrium point, but because of the government expenditure increase since the tax has incre uh, also increased. So, now you have the inward shift of the budget line. So, here we have the production possibility frontier which was earlier PPF1, but now it is having inward PPF2 because the because and at this level you will see that here you have the uh, the uh, the leisure demanded L1 and here at point A the corresponding consumption is C1, but because of this government expenditure increase if you think then it is leading to inward shift in the production possibility frontier and now you can see that the representative consumer is at point B. At B, he is taking C2 consumption and L2 is the leisure. So, it is clear that from the original point A, which was leading to L1 and C1, now here we have L2 and C2. So, there is a decrease in leisure and there is decrease in consumption. But here you have to think in two terms. One is that when this particular, uh, uh, when government expenditure is increasing, it means that it is leading to decrease in the income of the individuals because the taxes are going to increase. So, once the taxes are increasing this particular individual, it is, it is bound that this particular individual will have some compromise with regard to consumption. So, consumption will go down an increase in expenditure. So, this is the original uh, line with the production possible frontier. Increase in expenditure it is represented by here. So, here we have minus G1, here we have minus G2. So, this is what here we have that with the increase in expenditure when, when it is increasing. So, production policy curve has come down and now individual is moving from A to B. The decrease in leisure it is leading to increase in labor supply. So, once we have the increase in labor supply, so decrease in, uh, in consumption it is certain and here increase, uh, decrease in, uh, in leisure is also certain which means that it is leading to increase in labor supply. So, here what will be the outcome? Outcome will be that once you have uh, the increase in taxes, then this forces the individual to work for more number of hours just to meet the requirement of the consumption because if the government is exp increasing expenditure, it is charging higher taxes which leads to a, a, a somewhat reduction in the, um, in the consumption or the income of the individual and this will have compromising effect on both. The labor supply will increase, so because people will be looking to work for more number of hours, less of leisure. If the people are looking for more number of hours to work, then in that situation you have over, uh, forms asking uh, firms will go for more bargain. So, which means that people will be ready to work even at the lesser wage. And once you have the people working at the lesser wage, then you have the W falling. So, wage rate will fall. So, the immediate outcome is that because of this income effect that we saw because of the, the taxation uh, that strategy that government adopted by taking not just G1, but G2 amount of output from the representative consumers. So, this is certain that the consumption is decreasing. The leisure is also decreasing, so L decreases. This results in W to fall, labor supply to increase and this labor supply increase will lead to increase in output. So, this is very common that this particular individual will go. So, from the business cycle perspective, what is common here? common here is that when you have the increase in government expenditure, your 
why increases but consumption and leisure falls so consumption falls so when you have the increase in in increase in i would say the y increase in y so your n is also increasing because w falls so your n is increasing so n y are the pro cyclical the counter cyclical is consumption so that's why when you have the when you have government expenditure increase it is most likely that the it will lead to have a tax implications and this tax Im implication forces the individual to work for more number of hours this can also be linked with the with the uh, analysis that we do in most of the is and alm framework when we say that when when you have government expenditure increase it leads to increase interest rate and further crowding out phenomena but that is also having a uh, some kind of linkage with the consumption and government expenditure so with g consumption going down wage rate is falling which means that the standard of living of the individual will also fall so that's why governments are wary of going for immediate releasing of money immediate expenditure whenever they see any kind of uncomfortable situation so i hope this analysis makes it clear to all of you that in microeconomic foundations whatever we have derived the competitive equilibrium through the representative consumer and the firm it is helping us to macroeconomic policy making even in business cycle you can understand with these small small tools to to uh, have a better understanding about how certain variables react but here in this case the task is easier because we are assuming only one firm and one consumer and this this these two assumptions these two definition can be uh, 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 extrapolated on a large sample and then over aggregation will give you the picture uh, clear cut idea that how a particular policy has to be designed so this is the beauty of this so now we will stop here and we will try to cover the next part which is about the competitive equilibrium and further the dynamics and we'll be talking about also the how the competitive equilibrium can be linked with the pareto optimality condition whether the pareto optimality conditions can be called as the socially efficient condition then or the competitive equilibrium can be called as pareto optimal condition these two dimensions will be looking so thank you thank you so much